everybody, and welcome to the Sustainable Sheboygan Spotlight. My name is Heather Cleveland. I'm a member of the Sustainable Sheboygan Task Force and your host for today's show. And today we'll be talking about natural resources as it relates to water, water quality, wetlands, and land conservation. And our guest here to help us talk about this today is Sarah Majeris. Sarah and I know each other from our previous lives um, working at AECOM. Sarah was part of the Natural Resources Group, and she currently is an environmental scientist with Miller Engineers and Scientists here in Sheboygan. She's also on the land team and was a former board member of Glacier Lakes Conservancy. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and your education and get folks up to speed on what brought you here today? Sure, sure. I, uh, I guess I come from a childhood of lots of time in the outdoors and um, did my uh, undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I've had multiple professors and classes that inspired me to pursue wetland science and conservation and um, from there I ended up doing some environmental education work worked for DNR for a few years and um, or a few months rather and uh, ended up in the environmental consulting field where I where I am today and um, at Miller Engineers, we do a lot of um, field surveys, sort of um, baseline environmental work. And then from that work, we design solutions for stormwater management and water quality, a lot of what we're talking about today. Awesome. Thank you. So another reason why we have this program today is because we, um, the city of Sheboygan does have um, a sustainability plan. You can find it on the website. And they have a natural resources section that cites... Um, waterway protection, stormwater management and flood, flood control, and also native landscaping. So I just want to point that out and folks can find that on the city's website. So to re related back to everybody at home, it's summertime, it's summertime right now and everybody wants to jump in the lake and most likely they have seen the water quality signs. What do these signs tell us about water quality? Oh, well these signs came from legislation that was passed in 2000 by U.S. Congress as part of the Clean Water Act. Um, it's, it's an amendment to the Clean Water Act called the BEACH Act, and it's an acronym, and I'm not exactly sure what it stands for, <laughs> but basically it requires all coastal counties um, to, or states rather, to adopt standards, water quality standards at their beaches and monitor for those. Um, and the, the main indicator that they test for is E. coli, uh, which we've all heard a lot about in present day. Um, and that's what they use as the indicator to put up the signs. And what E. coli is basically is it's used to, um, well, high quantities of E. coli um, suggest that there's fecal matter and other disease-causing bacteria in the water. Um, could be caused by algae, could be caused by wildlife dropping, stormwater inputs, high water temperatures, sewage spills, all kinds of different things contribute. Um, so if E. coli levels are high at your beaches, you will see the red signs that are shown on, on the slide presentation, and, um, and you should probably stay away. There's also a website which we'll post at the end of this that uh, you can check, check in on your local beaches before you head out with sunscreen in hand, <laughs> and <laughs> maybe you'll want to choose another place to go. So. Okay, so it, then yeah. that helps tie into why people should care about wetlands and what we're talking about today. Yes. So are there any other ways, I guess, how that bacteria or E. coli can get in the water? You touched on a few. Are there any other ways? Yeah, any transport that carries stormwater into our waterways um, can, can deliver contaminants. So um, we need to be careful about what we're doing on land as well as what's happening in the water um, because every time it rains it washes off into our waterways. Um, stormwater inputs like sewers, gutters, any overland flow, swales, things of that nature, especially those that are channelized in concrete. Um, if there's trash in those ditches or anything, you know, cars every day, all the roads, cars produce chemicals that are on the roads every day. So every time it rains, Get those cleaner. elements are washed into our gutters and storm sewers. Um, so stormwater treatment is very important. Um, so litter, like I said, uh, pets, your pets can be a big contributor. So we always want to make sure we're picking up after them. Um, agricultural runoff, also very high contributor to water contamination, water quality. Um, nitrates, obviously from spreading of manure and phosphorus inputs from fertilizers. So 
Um, and then there's always your sewage overflows you need to be careful about. So um, lots of different contributors. Right. So in, in Sheboygan, our stormwater system discharges directly into Lake Michigan. So right. we can probably easily say that the highest risk would be after a rainstorm. So that's the time that you should probably make sure to check, like you said, on the website. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what can be done to keep contaminants and bacteria from polluting our waterways? Well, there are lots of different things we can do. Um, and, and, you know, anything from land conservation to creating engineered solutions for stormwater. Um, wetlands, natural buffers are a huge, it can be a huge improving factor on, on water quality. If, if there is a natural buffer which would allow for sediments to settle out and contaminants to biodegrade naturally within these wetland systems, um, you have the, the output or the water quality coming out would be a, much improved. Um, and similar to that, you know, engineers have been using, using those natural systems as examples for what are called biofilters or bioswales, um, rain gardens, which tend to be a little more aesthetically pleasing, um, utilize a lot of native plantings. Na and by native, I say, I mean um, plants that are, are indigenous to Wisconsin, um, many of which thrive in our soils and our environment, can handle the cold and um, hot cycles that we have here in Wisconsin. Um, and now that we have, you know, we have legislation, the city of Sheboygan has pretty high stormwater, stormwater management requirements for any new projects. Um, we can use these natural land conservation examples or wetland examples to engineer solutions and, and they are being used today. A lot of which you'll see on the slides that are being presented. <laughs> so it sounds like there's options to treat it at a micro level, like a residential or a company for that matter can do bioswales on the property. That's right. Or have, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Or can have impervious pavement. So pavement is another thing that is another place rather than being absorbed, you know, and the bacteria taking care of the bacteria, it will wash away. So yes. these p things that people can do, I think, on their own property. But then mm -hmm. another part is how the city looks at it. So a client of yours, maybe a city or a county or a state for that matter, where they would build it on the output of it. So absolutely. Yeah, you can treat it at the source or you can treat it later. Absolutely. Anywhere along the line, actually. Right. Yeah. Yep. So what are some examples of land conservation projects that aim toward improving water quality? Um, well, some that I can think of specifically and back to our talking about beaches. We um, at Miller Engineers and Scientists has been working with the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh to to um, improve water quality at beaches through stormwater management. So um, we've been working on beach nourishment projects, which essentially tries to um, minimize the amount of stagnant water that is in sitting on the sand beaches and. Um, which encourages waterfowl, geese, seagulls, et cetera, to congregate in these areas and go through their natural cycles. Um, <laughs> and then that fecal matter can contribute to the bacteria counts at the beaches. Um, so a lot of it involves grading of the sand and then implementing those natural plantings. Um, one example is Red Arrow in Manitowoc. I believe it's just south of their power plant. Um, there are some before and after pictures here on these slides that might be uh, kind of impressive when you look at them. Um, they've been installing boardwalks and these native plantings and they're actually micro rain gardens all along this area to still uh, maintain that stormwater function. So they are allowing for water to drain there and for the sediment to settle out and then for it to drain into Lake Michigan. So. Um, Selner Park in Two Rivers is another example of, of, a, of a beach nourishment project and then Egg Harbor in Door County as well. So um, another example might be that I can think of in my experience with Glacial Lakes Conservancy on a larger scale uh, we've been working to preserve, preserve properties that contribute or have a potential to contribute to better water quality. Um, our, our new mission is to focus on, on water, 
basically. And um, so we will be selecting, and on the land team what we do is lots of baseline survey work. And so we go and we meet with the property owners and we look at all of the different functions that that piece of property might offer to the environment. Um, and we're putting a high priority on waterways and properties that are adjacent to waterways because in preserving these plots of land, we will essentially be creating a natural buffer without any engineering. We're just preserving it and letting it, letting it do its thing. Um, and it's a great, great habitat for wildlife, local wildlife, and um, encourages floral diversity. Oh, there are so many benefits, so um, just land conservation in general is uh, very important. Excellent. So how, how does that work? So you say land conservation or land protection. Mm -hmm. What's the technical process a little bit of Glacial Lakes Conservancy and how they operate to protect the land? <clears throat> well, what Glacial Lakes Conservancy does is uh, we we will protect land through easements, and we'll also protect land by actually purchasing a preserve and managing it ourselves. Um, an easement is something that is still owned by the property owner and managed by the property owner, but there's a legal document associated with the deed called an easement that protects essentially the property into perpetuity. So um, that legal language carries on to the next property owner and you know future generations. So, so it's a bit of a restriction. Yes. Right. Yes. So when you go to pull a permit, they might say, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. There are certain, um, and there are, you know, certain requirements within the easement that dictate what you can and cannot do on that property. Some will limit development. Some will allow development, but only at a certain scale. Um, it just depends. It's great. Yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic opportunity for people to make sure that their land is protected mm -hmm. into the future. Mm -hmm. So if you could tell us a little bit about the techni um, technical piece of a wetland. So what is a wetland and why should people care about wetlands? Sure. Well, I brought with me the official definition of a wetland for Wisconsin. A wetland is an area where water is at, near, or above the land surface long enough to support hydrophytic vegetation, which is any vegetation that thrives and will grow in water and has soils indicative of wet conditions. So we, when we look at soils, we look at usually the top two feet and will either have very high organic matter or they will be depleted of their nutrients. Um, and then there are certain reactions that we can look for in different colors and things, but um, I'll, I'll let us know that there's a water table there at least for a certain portion of the year. Okay, and it so. has to do with the drainage of the land around it and the topography. Exactly, exactly. And what are the values of wetlands? Between the Wisconsin DNR and the Wisconsin Wetlands Association, they've come up with wetland functional, a list of wetland functional values. And these values are, are, um, are different for every single wetland. It's just a list that, you know, some wetlands will qualify for some and some won't. But I have the list here in front of me. Floral diversity is a big value. You know, we, we need to have the diversity to support our insects, our pollinators. We need to have diversity to inhabit different, different levels and different zones within a wetland. You have wet meadow wetlands that are, tend to be a little drier, um, can be ephemeral. You know, when we only see them in the spring, they may appear like a dry prairie in the fall, or you never know. Um, so we need to have that diversity to take on all of those different zones. You also have a, a shallow marsh, and you may only see cattails and burr reeds and different species in there. Wildlife habitat. They provide muskrat homes, which we may love or hate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fish, fish spawning, uh, all kinds of insects, invertebrates. Um, the list goes on and on. Songbirds, migrating birds, all kinds of, of different animals. Flood protection. You know, we're back to our stormwater. We, they, their storage basins for when we have these excess amounts of water. Big sponge. Big sponge, exactly, and a place for it to for it to chill out for a while before the rest of the environment can kind of catch up. Um, water quality protection, like we've been talking about, shoreline protection, um, wetlands along the edges of lakes and rivers, for example, can catch some of the wave action and some of the um, you know from large rain events or power boats, whatever it happens to be, um, and it reduces erosion. Groundwater recharge and discharge. We always have the, 
you know, we have to think about our, our groundwater, that's what we're drinking, <laughs> back to the <laughs> water quality issue. And then to think about, you know, wetlands are beautiful. I mean, you can look at pictures of wetlands and you see the multitude of species, plant and animal, um, open water versus sedge meadow, marsh areas. Um, so they're beautiful to recreate in. Um, even if you don't have waders, you can still look at them from uplands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't like the mosquitoes aspect of it, but they have to go somewhere. And, um, and then education and science. Wetlands can offer us, like I said, in stormwater treatment, they can offer us a lot of examples um, of what we need to be doing in our urban areas and our rural areas to help treat stormwater before it gets into our, our waterways and our drinking water. So research and science. Oh, very cool. Lots of, lots of good stuff. So they are important. I think we've established that. Can you give us an overview of the current regulations regarding wetlands? Sure. There are a lot of, um, a lot of things happening right now, especially in Wisconsin and recently. Um, basically, the Clean Water Act seeks to protect waterways and wetlands. Um, and Section 404 is, you know, what requires a permit for any impact in a wetland, any dredge material or fill that would impact a wetland. And then further, the um, Wisconsin NR-103 establishes water quality standards, which, upon which our permit system has been established. So um, we, for any wetland impact, you need to have a wetland water quality certification and prove that there is no better alternative for your project um, or something that would be less impactful to your environment and your waterways. Um, so the federal, on the federal level, wetlands are protected if they're contiguous with a navigable waterway. Um, so they're connected to another system. And Wisconsin takes that a step further, which is pretty neat, and they protect isolated pothole wetlands. So um, in the spring when your ephemerals are blooming and you see skunk cabbage and marsh marigolds Yay. blooming in the woods, sometimes that the water that they're growing in is only there for a couple of weeks or a month out of the year. That wetland is, mo most of the time those wetlands are isolated, and, um, but they're important areas for salamanders to breed and, and um, different amphibians. So Wisconsin protects those, which is great, yeah. which is great. Um, and then in 2012, Wisconsin passed legislature that allowed for general permits to be granted for any fill less than 10,000 square feet. And maybe I'm getting too technical here. Oh, no, that's great. <laughs> um, and, you know, we still need to go through the water quality certification process and an alternatives analysis is what it's called to mm -hmm. prove that, that there is no other option. Um, and we need to do this project, for example, putting in a road to a house or um, most of these are commercial agricultural projects, sure. um, farm expansions, things like that. Today, when you want to impact greater than 10,000 square feet of wetland, you're required to either compensate for that on your own property. You can purchase credits in a bank so that wetlands will be restored elsewhere mm -hmm. in and the this state. This is the mitigation piece. And this is the mitigation mm -hmm. piece. Or you can um, buy credits in an actual, uh, well, there's a mitigation bank mm -hmm. and there's an in lieu fee program. The bank is you're buying. It credits in an existing wetland conservation project. The in lieu fee program, you're buying credits in a fund that is going to go towards future restoration. So, so that our net wetland area is the same. That's right. Yes. Ideally. And ideally in the same watershed so that we're okay. still getting that filtering. So everybody has buffering. equal protection. Exactly. Yeah. Filtering buffer in the same watershed. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Go Wisconsin. So kind of complicated, but. <laughs> yeah, but all good. I mean, it's good to know these are important. You know, there are people like you doing things about it. And I also, I know that you recently obtained, and I might mess this up, but the, Wis the wetland science certification. Yes. Could, could you explain that a little bit more and what it took to get that um, and what it's about? Sure. The um, Society for Wetland Scientists is a, an international organization um, that that supports wetland scientists and, and their research. Um, they, it's a great group of researchers, wetland practitioners, 
regulators um, from all over the world that, that work to protect these large areas of wetlands that have these functional values that we were talking about. Um, and they, their certification program um, is something that just requires a certain amount of years of experience, level of education, and, um, and you know, it's, it's basically a, a club, you know, mm -hmm. of, of like-minded folks who can share ideas and uh, work towards protecting wetlands into the future. So in your job, you are often tasked with defining wetlands. So you walk onto a property, what are just some common indicators of wetlands, just to let people know, like if they have a sure. wetland on their property? Yeah, you can look for, the first thing that I always look for are plants. Um, plants and whether or not your feet are wet. <laughs> <laughs> your feet are wet, you're probably in a wetland. <laughs> um, and you know, you can look for soils, some of the soils in wetlands can be rather you know, spongy. Um, and then, you know, cattails, the common plants that people know grow in wetlands. Sedges are uh, grass-like species, but they have three different angles on their stems. Uh, those are most likely wetland, but there are some upland species. Um, there's a great book out there that's uh, Wetland Plants of Minnesota and Wisconsin, and there are a lot of common wetland species in this publication. And I think the Army Corps of Engineers published it a number of years ago, and uh, there are a lot of... It's a go-to manual. Yes, and, and Wisconsin DNR website, which will be posted at the end of this interview, uh, is a nice resource for wetland plants as well. So. Okay, very cool. Mm -hmm. If a young person would like to go to school with this, or have a, you know, go to school for something like this, or mm -hmm. have a job similar to yours, what steps should they take? Let's say they're in high school and they're you know, thinking about what they want to do. Yeah, my, my recommendation to the younger generations would be to get out and volunteer. We have so many opportunities in Sheboygan County where you can get out and volunteer. We have Maywood Environmental Center where there are both educational opportunities to get out into the woods and into your wetlands and literally get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. um, there are the multiple nonprofit organizations. Glacial Lakes Conservancy has multiple opportunities to volunteer on our preserves. Um, we have land walks where naturalists will give tours of the, our natural areas that we're protecting. And um, there's always work days where we can work on invasive species and, and different, which is a different concept. But And uh, the Sheboygan River Basin Partnership also has beach cleanups every year and different opportunities for, for volunteerism. Um, so I would start there if I were a young person. And um, through that, you network with people and get to, know, get to know what your local community is doing and, and hopefully establish some mentorship. You, know, you can always call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, really engineer I'm happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> and then what sort of classes should they be thinking about in high school? And then if they're in college, what sort of classes sure. did you have to take when you were in school? Well, I think your basic biology courses, find a, find a course that you do some field work, field trips, get out into the woods and uh, get your hands dirty and learn about what, what's surrounding us. Spend as much time outside as you can. Um, so biology, zoology mm -hmm. in high school, I, ag, a lot of the agricultural programs where they, um, you know, spend a lot of time in those systems and learning about crops and soil science, those are important. Um, and then in, in university setting, I would recommend taking as many field courses again as you can. My inspiration was a wetland ecology course that I took at UW-Madison. And the professor, whose name was Quentin Carpenter, was fantastic. And he's the reason I'm sitting here today. Isn't that wild? Yeah, one person. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And it's interesting, too, that you could, with experience like yours, you could work for a consulting firm like you do, or you could work for the state, yes. or you could work for a private firm who does a lot of development, you know, telecommunications or roads or things like that. Yes, yes. Fortunately, the legislation in Wisconsin and our municipalities has really come around to being conscious of... And proactive. And proactive of stormwater and what the impacts of development might be to the environment, so... 
Right, yeah, so we need it seems to be working together, in my opinion, to <coughs> just make sure they do the right thing in the, in the design phase even, you know, yes. looking out here, having, you know, people go out in the field and sketch that out, and then we'll decide where it goes. Absolutely. Yeah, which, yeah. yay Wisconsin again. Yes, <laughs> yay Wisconsin. And I know you mentioned a little bit about um, how people can learn more, and, or I guess you mentioned how people can be involved. How can mm -hmm. they learn more about wetlands? Yeah, here I have links to Sustainable Sheboygan. Your group is doing a great job <laughs> and educating the public. Um, and the, if you would like to check out your beaches, uh, the status of your bacterial levels at the beaches, check out the Wisconsin Beach Health website. And um, they'll show there are three different signs. There's a, a green, a yellow, and a red. And that'll let you know kind of where bacterial levels are at. Um, the Wisconsin Wetland Association is a great nonprofit group in Wisconsin. They do, they're very active in which legislation is passed and, um, and provide a lot of education for landowners who are interested in protecting and restoring wetlands on, on their properties. Um, and then, like I said, the DNR wetland link here is an excellent resource. Um, they have a lot of information about plants and animals and wetlands, and um, I would recommend checking that site out as well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And you did mention um, native plants. I know you are very passionate about those also. Can you just touch on the importance, I guess, just quickly sure. as we wrap up, the importance of native plants and kind of how this relates to this? Yeah. Um, well, native plants are designed, their genetics are specifically designed to grow in Wisconsin and to grow in, dis in Wisconsin landscapes. They tend to be hardy and they, you know, they, they colonize in areas where it's very tough to grow other species, you know, from Europe. And they each have their own niche or specific community type that they prefer to grow in. Be it soil, shade, soil, things like that. Exactly. Different environmental conditions. And uh, so they and they oftentimes, because they're so happy here, they have deeper root systems, they improve the quality of the soils, they, you know, they're, they're, they're perfect. Um, and the deeper root systems help break up the soils and they have lots of interactions with fungi in the soils and relationships. There's a lot of um, compatible relationships between plant species, insect species, the whole soils, ecosystem. the whole ecosystem, it all works together. And the, the alternative to that is an invasive species, which is something that may have been brought over from Europe or another country and can come into Wisconsin and basically create a monoculture and take over these large swaths of, swaths of wetland or prairie and um, eliminate some of the native species. So higher diversity of plants means higher diversity of insects and so on. And if you have these invasive species moving in, you're kind of eliminating that. So it's important to to keep keep control of those invasives if you do have them in your personal yard and landscape, um, or if they're on a larger scale, we have to control them so we can bring back our Wisconsin species because they're beautiful and they work. <laughs> and I know you can go to your local garden center and ask for native species of plants and you know help us. I guess bring back the native plants. Um, we could do a whole topic just on that. But yes. thank you everybody for coming and tuning in to the Sustainable Sheboygan Spotlight. Thank you, Sarah, to, for joining us. Okay.